there and welcome to the Drax Files Radio Hour. My name is Draxter Dupre. I'm without Joe Yardley today because Joe is uh, is AWOL somewhere in in the real world. I've looked all over the grid and I couldn't find her anywhere, so we don't have her. But um, great show today, though. On the show, Kaya Angel, maker of Angel Manor. He runs the Rose Theater in Second Life, and he is the talk of the town, uh, or the world, so to speak, because of his video that we covered last week, Second Life, A Different Perception. Um, a great deep conversation today with Kaya about Second Life Perception, marketing, why people stick around, why people leave, the stumbling blocks that virtual worlds with the level of freedom to create possibly will always have. So basically... This is a conversation uh, that I think Linen Lab staffers in particular would probably get a lot of out of get get a lot out of. Now, before we go on with the show, a couple of housekeeping notes. You can get in touch with us as you know. Ping the show's avatar Drax files. Send us new scoops. Send us press releases. Let us know what's happening. On Skype, you can leave a voicemail under Drax files. You can become a sponsor. You can have your own banner displayed on the website. Mentioned every single show by our credits announcer. He would love to read new copy. And as a matter of fact, we have a new sponsor this week, Giza Creations or Giza Creations. I actually have to check with Alster Ilan how to pronounce it. Um, Giza Creations, great clothing for men and women. They have a big, big event also coming up called Love is in the Air, ready for Valentine's Day. There's a special banner on the side of our blog. Click it and check out what it's all about. You can support the show individually by taking out a individual voluntary subscription of $100 Linden dollars per month. That's $25 Linden dollars per show. We'll send you the subscription device made by Chris Lehman of uh, Botanical. So uh, since Joe isn't here, I have to go through all the news myself. Uh, if you're tired of my voice, skip forward until you reach Kaya Angel the interview with Kaya, and then you get to hear his deep thoughts and his pl very pleasant voice. So Stitcher, by the way, one of our sponsors, is very good for skipping forward in 30-second increments. I highly recommend uh, subscribing uh, to the show on Stitcher. In news, the Sundance Festival is going on uh, in Park City, Utah. Still going uh, strong. Uh, I'm not there. I'm here in my garage. But the Sundance Festival, where I have been in 2008 with our friend Noni de la Peña. Back then, it was all about virtual Gitmo. It was all about Second Life. Today, I'm here in my garage. I'm repeating myself. And Noni is hobnobbing uh, at the Sundance Film Festival. I'm not jealous. I'm very proud of her because she was also on National Public Radio. She was on PBS. She's exhibiting the Syria Project there where you can immerse yourself into a Syrian refugee camp. You're walking down the streets of Aleppo where a bomb goes off. The audio is real audio. You're looking around with Oculus-type goggles, and you're right there. As you know, Noni is known for calling VR an empathy machine. We had her on show 24. I'll link to it. She was also on the PBS NewsHour. Uh, we're linking to the video. It's actually a pretty good piece that covers immersive filmmaking. There's several projects underway uh, at the Sundance Film Festival. Among Noni, who was interviewed in the PBS piece, there's uh, director Chris Milk, who also has a project about Syria called Cloud Over Sidra, where in one scene, you're in a tent with a 12-year-old girl, a refugee, and she's talking about her story. You can look around, but basically you're, you're focusing on, on her, which is fascinating. So you have the ability to look around I don't know if you have the ability to walk out. Probably not. Uh, incidentally, as we reported, Cosmo Scharf, who we interviewed a few weeks ago, has a new um, startup that deals exactly with that. Visionary VR is off offering the game designer a programming tool, essentially, where they can gently force the player to keep with the story, something that is arguably very difficult in something like Second Life, where you can just... You know, you can just sit there and do nothing and you can just completely wander off the path if you decide to do that. I'm not a gamer, though. I mean, that's the disclaimer. I'm not a gamer. Uh, so for me, this is actually really um, limiting something that is that is free, limiting it back to something a little bit uh, not so attractive, frankly. But anyway, uh, in that PBS piece, there's a film... Uh, mentioned called Wild with Reese Witherspoon and a guy named Felix Lajeunesse 
I think we talked about him. He did a bunch of really cool VR music videos. He redid uh, Wild for VR, and you can sit next to Reese Witherspoon, and she's talking to you. And what's interesting is that PBS reporter Jeffrey Brown asks uh, Felix, you know, wh what do you project? When can I talk to an actual real-life actor in a situation like this? And and does the real-life actor uh, talk back to me? Uh, when is that going to happen? And uh, here's the answer that uh, Felix Lajeunesse gave him. You will have to give us maybe 10 years for yeah. that to be <laughs> actually possible. But uh, I think for now, it, it just brings you in that place where if she looks at you, it, it engages you emotionally in a very special way. But you think in 10 years? Uh, for a proper piece of storytelling that was pre recorded to be sort of interacting with whatever you're saying it feels complex mm -hmm. and you know but uh, probably not impossible not impossible but will we want it so that was from a piece that ran on PBS NewsHour with uh, reporter Jeffrey Brown uh, reporting live from Sundance and that question is a valid one you know do we do we want it do we want to be in virtuality talking to uh, AI versions of Hollywood stars Frankly, I don't. I want to talk to real people uh, in virtuality, not not a uh, not an AI Reese Witherspoon. Uh, but that's just me. Joe is not here to to tell you what she thinks. I'm sure she'll um, she'll tell you next week. There are also grants offered through uh, various entities to entice filmmakers to make VR movies. And then lastly, Oculus debuted uh, Oculus Studio, a movie studio that is developing VR. And they have a number of movies in the works. The possibilities of VR are much more vast than we initially thought that would be. Because you matter in that story. The way you experience the story matters. While the way I experience a movie doesn't matter for how the movie is told. That was Sashka Anseld from uh, Pixar, who is now the creative director at Oculus Studios. They already showed a movie, a horror sci-fi mystery movie called Lost uh, at Sundance. As The Verge is reporting, they already have seven movies uh, in the pipeline. They are experimenting with that genre and under the Oculus brand. So Oculus is is in the news continuously and um, taking over taking over Hollywood now. I'm going to take the opportunity that Joe isn't here to give you one more piece of my opinion. Again, subscribe to Stitcher so you can skip forward. I think that all this stuff is really nice, but unless the technology is empowering the individual creator and democratizes content creation in the way that Second Life has, I'm not really impressed. You know, I worked on big projects. I'm working on a really big project right now in my day job. That They have a lot of money. They have highly trained individuals. Everybody knows their job inside out, the best of the best. And it will come out killer looking, killer sounding. Of course, because there's a budget, there are people being paid, people have equipment, and these professionals have done it before, so they will do it again. You know, anything less would be kind of disappointing, right? But if the disenfranchised folks, the folks that have never been given the opportunity to express themselves creatively or, or given the confidence by their teachers, their parents, their peers, whatever, to be told, you know, you can do this, when they get there and they take the tools and they create something, I think to me that's beautiful. And that is the power and the revolutionary uh, ethos that, that is still in Second Life. And there is there's really nothing like it. Okay, anyway. I'm a broken record, but if you're still listening to this show, then I suppose you're like broken records. We just hope that Linden Lab keeps that spirit in in, in SL 2.0, and 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 I'm I'm confident that they that they that they will. All right, a couple news items, then we go straight to Kaya Angel. Uh, Rod Humble, former CEO of Linden Lab, is back with a game. He's back. He's back from. From uh, from wherever he was, probably also in his basement or his garage, a game where you can create and spread an ancient religion. What a timely topic. And the game is called Jihad. No, it's not called that. Actually, you create your own religion. You go forth and spread it. Uh, yes, Tom Cruise financed this game and it's called Scientology. No, okay. Uh, my jokes are, are lame. Acknowledged. The game is called Cults and Daggers. There's assassination, there's intrigue, there's, there's more uh, traditional convincing uh, to get on board via indoctrination. <laughs> and so on and so the game is uh, single player against the AI or multiplayer and up to four um, players. And the game is available, available in February on Steam. And I'm working to get uh, Rod on this show 
to talk about it. And maybe I can squeeze in some, you know, some left field questions about Second Life and all that. I, I, I'll, I'll contact him to pretend that I'm gonna want to talk about his game, but then I'm gonna it's gonna all be about Second Life. Anyway, before we go to the interview with creator Kaya Angel from Angel Manor Estate, a new feature on the show, the musical interlude, where we prove that SL musicians have what it takes and are not just losers like me. Since our 1,000 listeners per week are apparently not musicians and haven't sent any music, we have to play the usual suspects. That's right. It's time for Terry Lynn Melody again to sing for us. The song is called Silver Locket. Half a penny on a railroad track. Whistles blowing and they don't look back. Bare feet walking by. To fish the trestle around the bend. And by a little time to get his spirit. Melody with Silver Locket and now it's time to play my conversation with Kaya Angel that I taped a couple days ago. Kaya made waves within the SL community with his video uh, Second Life A Different Perception. We talked about it last week. He shows some nasty griefer video expert excerpts and then offers kind of a, a deeply personal story about his passion and, and his business which is building structures, buildings, beautifully detailed palaces, period pieces. He sells those. He runs the Rose Theater. The Rose Theater is home to many musicians, also nonprofits, can be used for fundraisers. In the video, he talks about how Second Life lets him realize his passion through these buildings and through building community. In the video, he shows all the new bells and whistles, obviously, the advanced lighting system materials and so on and so forth. Of course, they're not new to the 3D modeling community, but in Second Life, they're fairly new. Well, we talk about it ad nauseum. The press doesn't seem to have noticed that. So that is really cool. It's an effective video. It has over 4,000 hits. When I spoke to Kaya, 
we covered a lot of ground, uh, a lot of deep thought uh, on virtuality from Kaya. Most fascinating, his take on what makes people actually stick around in Second Life, what makes us identify with our avatar, our community. And I think all this can be applied not only to SL, but any competitor in the new metaverse race, high fidelity, face world, whatever is coming, of course, SL 2.0. Anyway, loads of stuff, but I had to start with the origin story. Here's Kaya on how he came into Second Life and how he started building almost 10 years ago. I was a gamer in my youth, in my in my early 20s. I used to love playing computer games, and I kind of got into various online games. I just found them much more interesting than the ones, you know, the games you would buy where you just follow the mission. I found them to be much more dynamic when you'd be interacting with other people. And uh, there was a certain game that I played and built up a really large community. And I kind of broke the rules within that game in terms of what the expectation was. Uh, I shan't say what the game was, but it was a game in which you could you could build a city. And there were certain houses you could have and you could take various professions. And one of the professions was mayor. And uh, you would have to get people to come to your city and they would place a house and you'd kind of get skills based on, on the popularity of your video and get different gradings and stuff and I found that really really interesting that you could kind of build a community it just kind of maxed out really and I kind of didn't know where to take it and somebody had spoken about Second Life and my interest in it was really I think it was something that uh, Philip said in a speech I must have heard about Second Life the idea that if you were given the tools to recreate society and a reality what would we do it's a philosophical question. Would we repeat the same things or would we do something incredibly different? So I went in to look at it and it's obviously Second Life for anybody going in is just this crazy, bizarre experience when you first go in. And this is, I'm going back sort of 10 years ago now when Second Life would crash every 20 minutes, but still kind of fascinating. There was a strange intrigue about the, the place. When you came in um, and everything was crashing and everything was chaotic, you you still stuck around. That's fascinating to me. There's a, there seems to be a certain personality that actually gets attracted even uh, to that kind of unformed um, chaos where you where you feel, hey, I can be part of actually building this. So the, what you can call it the pioneer spirit or whatever. But a lot of gamers, even today, they go in for five minutes and they go, this looks like crap. Uh, I'm out of here. I did think that to a degree because I'm, I'm a bit of a graphic snob. I love things to look really good. What overshadowed that was the, the philosophical and social questions about what people would do. And so I guess I kind of stuck around because I was interested to see how this would grow and, and what it would actually become in the end. When did you start building? Did you start building pretty soon or did you explore, take a take a year off exploring and then found your plot and go like, uh, the bakery, bakery is here and here's the blacksmith and I'm going to be the builder now? I don't know if anybody really goes into Second Life with a specific aspiration. I think that's very hard to, to do. You have to kind of get the lay of the land and try and work out I think that's one of the really difficult things for a lot of people when they first go into Second Life is to, because they're, they're so used to going into be it a game or a, a social network where where there's a predetermined expectation or, or there's a plan of what you should do. And you go into Second Life and you're like, what, what do I do? And it's like, well, anything you want. And people aren't used to that level of freedom and choice. My, my theory is that this is still the main issue why it's not growing exponentially it is just overwhelming uh, the amount of choices is overwhelming and the catch-22 is my opinion when you narrow those choices with funneling the incoming folks through these uh, gates then you actually narrow it too much because like you said you know you might come in with an idea hey i want to be building or i came in because a friend of mine told me you can do music let's form a band i never formed a band i became a, a machinimator Right. So it, it, it would narrow you, I suppose. But then at the same time, majority of folks are intimidated by that plethora of options. Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky issue. How do you get people to stay in a virtual world when they're so used to, to having specific things that they are told that they should do or can do? But if you supplement that by 
artificially adding things for them to do, then you're taking away the very essence of what Second Life is supposed to be about. Exactly. Or any virtual world that comes here after. I mean, in, in, in my mind, it wouldn't be interesting if, if there weren't these options. But, but how about you? How did you become, let's do the evening news uh, accelerated version, how you became a master builder? It starts simply when you get a house. Otherwise, you're just a, a homeless wanderer walking around, kind of not knowing what to do. And I actually went into Second Life with a friend of mine who had been in the other virtual world I was talking about before. And she actually got a little beach house. And it was a weird change in the dynamic when you get a home, when you have a base that you can then start to make your own and she would start to say well i need this i would like that and and so i started to build bits and bobs for her so i, I remember building like a little jetty out uh, into the sea with a little seating thing on she wanted a kitchen so i built a kitchen so i i ended up building all these bits and bobs for her and it changed my second life experience quite profoundly as soon as you start to customize second life and make it your own it, there's a, it becomes a completely different experience and that's i think one of the really difficult things that people come into second life and they don't connect with it until you start customizing your avatar and making it a representation of you and until you have land and start building something and and personalizing your own space then you don't you can't understand what second life is now we're, we're already completely in the middle of sort of philosophizing also how to move forward i guess and that's actually where i really want to kind of lead with you let's speculate or let's theorize or let's brainstorm how do you change perception how do we um move forward in terms of getting other people interested in this and you said something that really resonates with me because I actually do think that land, maybe land should be free after all, you know, because then you have immediately at least your little plot. I mean, the Linden homes, as we all agree, are useless in the sense that you can't really customize them. I mean, you're relegated to be sort of a renter in a suburb. And customization is key. It's all about customization. In order to connect with Second Life, it's all about projecting yourself into a virtual world. And that's something that that nobody has done before. People who aren't used to virtual worlds, this is completely new frontier of understanding. If you've played computer games, you're very used to being given a character. You play a role of a character, predetermined, and you follow the story. This idea that going into a virtual world and then uh, creating yourself is the hardest thing to get people to stay long enough to do but it is the turning point that makes people stay and makes people leave if you don't get to that point quick enough then you'll leave if you get to that point where you are uh, getting land and customizing yourself to a large degree then you'll start to feel that the avatar is no longer a little vehicle that you just drive around in a virtual world. It becomes a digital projection of yourself. That's actually why I think the basic, remember the um, the two viewers, the basic viewer and the advanced viewer, I, I, I'm convinced that's why it failed. I actually ran into a noob once in the basic, who was in the basic viewer, and I was asking her, you know, how can I help you? And she says, well, this is awesome. Can I customize my avatar? And I go like, of course you can. It's an absolutely myriad of ways. Uh, just go here and click here. And she says, well, I don't see those options. And I go like, why don't you see those options? And then it dawned on me, oh my God, she was in the basic viewer. And the basic viewer didn't have those options. It's so crucial. The whole, even down to the fact that you get to choose those sort of uh, preset avatars when you first create an account, People will just stick with them because they'll go, okay, I'll pick that one. That's the closest representation of how I would like to be represented in a virtual world. And they'll stick with that. I would, I would actually give people a much broader range of options, but not a specific, here's your finished avatar. So straight away from the very first point, they're having to create an avatar from a larger selection of things so they're really starting to have to think about how they want to be represented yeah people have suggested to actually outsource this to the web that's a smart idea i think joe said that also that you actually when you sign up online there you have an uh, avatar creator before you even go in world 
yeah. uh, before we go to all this philosophical stuff, this is so fascinating, uh, Kaya. We're really on the same wave. Like it's fun, fascinating. I actually have to tell listeners that I did study sociology once for three months. Okay. Uh, almost one semester, actually, almost. So we're both qualified uh, to talk about that subject. And I read three books. But seriously, how then did it evolve uh, for you? You learned, obviously, prim building. And then did you create a shop right away? Or how did you grow to where you are today? The first things I started to build, I say a bit of furniture for the sort of beach house we had. But then I started to go to sandboxes and build houses. And they were they were actually modern. I'm known for building uh, like period buildings, palaces and that sort of stuff. But originally I was building modern buildings. I actually did wasn't particularly into period stuff before Second Life. Um, and what I used to do is go... To, exploring areas that I would find visually interesting and I would sort of reverse engineer things so I would click on items and obviously this is the, the the days where everything was just made from prims and you had to cut prims in elaborate ways to get very specific shapes but if you edit click on something you can see the component parts that would make up certain structures or shapes and I became fascinated with how people were using prims and cutting prims to get the shapes that they wanted so I spent a lot of time going around reverse engineering things and then would take it back to a sandbox and see if I could kind of use that technique and, and, and build upon that. Um, my first few houses, which I still have in my inventory, which are incredibly primy and uh, very bizarre when I look at them. Um, quite early on, as I said, in my previous virtual world, I'd built this city community and the idea of building community was clearly something that I had in me and wanted to do again. And so I set about doing a, a ballroom, which was, uh, we got a quarter sim, built a ballroom, very, very, fairly basic. It was sort of the first incarnation of, of the Rose Theatre. The problem was there was just loads of lag because there was loads of shops on the sim. We were sharing it with another shop which had loads of tempres uh, vendors, which just caused chaos. But the, the idea initially was to, to to create community and try and find a niche. And I went for a 1930s style ballroom. Um, that then progressed because my, my real life job is in theater at the time. I do lighting design and technical set design for theaters. And so I naturally started to do sort of live music but would add stage productions to them, light shows and sets, and people really flock to those so we'd do a dj event and you wouldn't get many people but then you'd do something that was different something that was new something that people hadn't really seen before and we got a lot more people would come and so rather than sort of being a dance hall it sort of start, slowly started to move towards being a theater which i still had this kind of ongoing thing where i was a perfectionist and i wanted to continuously improve if i found a new way of, to build something i would i would changed the building uh, and I kept adding bits and changing bits and tweaking bits and over time it became more sort of grand uh, ornate theatre opposed to the period 1930s ball but it's just this constant desire to improve I kind of can't stop just yesterday I was uh, adding new mesh windows to the uh, to Angel Manor I, I kind of keep looking ahead of, of, of what can I improve what doesn't look realistic what is reminding me that it's a virtual world and that kind of seems to be my drive when I'm building all the time it's like that doesn't quite look real enough or that texture could be better or the scale of that isn't right I just want to mention that if if, if uh, listeners are not familiar with the Rose Theatre uh, uh, there are fundraisers frequent fundraisers by the Creations for Parkinson's group and other groups um, uh, how would you describe it for people who are not in it I mean we're on the radio unfortunately Somebody once uh, described it as a cultural mecca, which is probably the phrase that I loved uh, the most in terms of there is an art gallery, which we show artists from all over Second Life, and we have a, a quite a, a high rotation rate in the art gallery. We have two performance spaces, so we, we support live music artists all the time. We do the fundraising aspect, which we have a, a new person called Lisa Valentino, who now is actively looking for external charities to support. But charity work's quite a tricky thing to get right, because if you do too many, then people kind of get fed up of 
giving money. And, and I think it's really important that when you do a charity event, you're really giving them something in return in terms of you really have to put on a good show or make it a really great event for them to come along so that you're, you're giving them something in return for, the, for their work with the charity. Actually, I was auctioned off last time, and I think the person who won me never um, redeemed the <laughs> – redeemed this. If you're listening, oh, no. and, and I'm infinite, I'm completely available. I, I, I hope I didn't miss any uh, IM or email or anything. Uh, if you're listening out there, uh, I'm, I'm here. But now a listener comes like, it was me. <laughs> Anyone could do that now. Now you're now you're going to be a slave to somebody that you might not want to be. Well, you need to get your receipt, whoever you are. <laughs> Let's go to the vi video. You released a video which is remarkable, and it's so great that it kind of counters the uh, sort of my theory. Also, you know, flood the YouTubes with stuff that really looks good. It's maybe the way to drown out uh, the garbage, the the same old, same old. Uh, outdated snapshots you know visually and you you described yourself as a i don't know a, a snob uh i suppose a visual snob or what did you say or an, a graphic snob a graphic snob so you put this video together that first starts off with uh what is your perception of second life and you you show i think uh, excerpts of trolling videos uh, griefers and and just uh also really bad graphics but also the interaction really kind of negative interaction and then you cut to um your creations and you got some really good response but how can other people utilize the strategy or possibly also linden lab use this kind of strategy i think the problem we've all got in second life is that second life is unlike anything else it's like when you try and explain second life or sell second life to somebody it's like trying to describe a new color and you kind of go, it's kind of like red and it's kind of like blue, but it's not purple. There, there, there is not the linguistic capability to explain what Second Life means. So the only way I've tried to do it through video is to, to explain it through the emotion. So the, the second part of the video that you're talking about, which goes into showing the building parts and, and the soundtrack was very important to me. I spent hours trying to find the right pieces of music because it was trying to connect and show how what Second Life feels to me. And, and when I walk around the buildings that I create and what I hope other people feel in those spaces is, is the, the emotion that I tried to evoke in that video. You can't sell or explain Second Life linguistically. It's just so hard. Everyone's been trying to do it for years. So, so my, my strategy just kind of is to try and sell it emotionally to what it would feel like to you if you can stay in Second Life long enough to get it, to understand what it means. It stops just being this strange, weird place and it becomes an emotional experience, an emotional connection to the environment, to the community, to the people you have and to how you connect with and understand yourself. But the really cool thing that that I think is what you actually accomplished is because you're a builder and you do a lot of community stuff and it's full of, I mean, your creations in, in world are full of people. You don't show a lot of people. You focus on detail of the building part. And or, uh, normally I would say, you know, if somebody would have pitched me this, I would say, well, you know, people are missing. You can't make an emotional connection with a building, but you really accomplished that because this is your medium. Your medium is building and you're building places where people people basically congregate and you make these places beautiful and that's why it resonates right i'd hope so i get uh, some incredible comments from people who just come and spend time and they'll say it's kind of like a slice of heaven that they come and sit there and that that there's an emotion that they feel in the space and this for people not used to second life it sounds crazy and sounds weird because again there's no comparison to this people don't understand how you how a virtual environment can emote you. But if you've truly made a connection to your avatar, your avatar isn't a vehicle just in a, in a pixelated world. You, you genuinely have a connection and feel that you're in that space. So if you create an environment that's beautiful and, and inspiring in some way, then people actually emotionally feel that. I mean, in Angel Manor, there's, there's about 18 people that live there. So there's a, there's a really nice community of very like-minded people. Uh, there's a number of people that work there. And when we have events, it's really busy. When I mean, it's nine sims, I should say, as well. So um, you can often be there walking around and it feels very empty because people are spread out over the nine sims. Um, 
But my personal experience is I don't need to be in a really busy area to have a really nice experience. I can go there as myself because this isn't about always connecting with other people. It's about teleporting yourself um, into an environment that you maybe couldn't explore in real life. It's not always just about people. It's, it's, it's often like it might be freezing cold. Like recently I changed um, the estate from winter and I did that quicker than I might have because it's really cold at the moment and I'm tired of it being cold. <laughs> In the in Birmingham, it is where you are. I mean, it's hot here. I'm sorry to tell you. It's well, it's it's fairly cold here, but I was kind of sick of logging in and feeling cold as well, which might not make sense to people. But if if you have a connection to a space, then it if it looks cold, it kind of feels cold. And I wanted I wanted the flowers, I wanted the green back. So I kind of last week did a three 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 day rush to kind of get it all back to summer. Oh no! And uh, my next video is all. Uh in snow and i felt really good because i love the snow and here where we live on the central coast california there was there's absolutely no snow so i miss it for me it's exactly the other way around if i go in like oh my god it's beautiful this is exactly what i'm missing kylie who works in who runs the galleries there she loves the snow as well she's in the states and has probably said very similar things i think she was quite disappointed that it went as early as it did you said something very important uh that you uh that it's not always about people and always you know interacting sometimes it's that kind of solitude that you're experiencing for yourself you're experiencing places by yourself but again the key is then uh, that you have to make that connection with yourself obviously because if you don't have a connection with the avatar then i suppose it's pointless but i think that's one of the first things that happens your connection with the avatar is the first stage of you understanding Second Life. I saw a BMW commercial today that has a clip from NBC Today Show, I guess, with Katie Couric was on, and she, and they were talking about the internet. And it was from 93, I guess, or 94. And she says, the internet, how do I get there? I mean, how do I get to that internet? And it was, it's hilarious. They incorporate the clip. And uh, Second Life has been compared to the internet in many ways. And I do think it's really valid when we talk about the um, difficulty to, to convey what it is. Because you're showing such great visuals and people may not see that when they log in. So obviously, because it's user created, it's all across the board. Now, let me ask you, what should Linden Lab do? Is it is it a fair marketing point to just get rid of old stuff? Such as what? What would you get rid of? I don't know. Break content? Force everyone to have materials? You can imagine the, the riots that would ensue if something like that was to happen. I, I never think of Second Life as a finished product. And I don't think it should ever be sold as a finished product. Second Life is a foundation of uh, a new frontier of entertainment that just isn't there with technology yet. I've no doubt that in the future we will all plug into virtual worlds and, and fly around the most incredibly beautiful, insane, real environments. That will happen. Anybody that doesn't think that happen will happen is 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 not really with where technology is heading. But like with with any technology, um, it's like you'll have all of the the older generation talking about everyone constantly on their phones all the time and nobody looks up. Well, well, yeah, and that's not a good thing. But it's an intermediate stage. Like this isn't technology isn't done yet. I think that there is an end point that is still quite far into the future where we will be connecting in a way with, that we can't understand at this current point in time. So I don't think you should ever sell Second Life as a finished product. Here it is. It has to be presented as a, this is this is an ongoing thing. This is an exploration of a new frontier. I was just uh, clarifying to my listeners who hate me, uh, don't write that hate mail quite yet. I'm not suggesting that Linden Lab should break content. I was playing devil's advocate uh, and you gave exactly an answer that is the only answer that you should give that this is not a polished stone that you sell, a, a polished uh, diamond that you sell or a ring of some sort. Um, this is an ongoing experiment that is obviously user created and the, the quality on the aesthetics vary. The one thing I probably would do is change the name Second Life. I don't think that's done it any favor. I do think that it's an accurate description to many people of what it is, but it just conjures up such a 
an image from the people who don't know it. There's because instantly you're kind of implying that people are living a second life and therefore they're not happy with their first. And I think in some ways that leads to, people feel quite embarrassed when they say that they take part in second life because they know straight away people are going to be going, oh, well, your first life must not be very good if you're having to resort to a second life. My co-host, uh, Joey Ardley, who is not with us today, although has a trick where she says, you know what? I have a second life because I have so many interests, they, I can't all cram them in into my first life. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point. So people explore many things that they, they just can't, uh, can't do in reality. But you're right. It's interesting because it's usually the Silicon Valley trick is to name a tech product some, something that is not existing like Google. And then uh, people have to adopt it. If it's successful, they, uh, they create a new word. Um, life, is a, life is a strong word. People have a lot of, a lot of feelings about that word. You're talking about uh, Second Life 2.0. Um, people are, I think, not aware. I say it almost every week that uh, this is uh, far away. People who start sitting on the sidelines and waiting that Second Life 2.0 opens and stop engaging with Second Life, I think they're making a huge mistake. It's like saying, you know what? In 10 years, I'm going to retire. I'm going to just sit here for now. <laughs> Uh, I think the exodus or whatever, the transition, I think also will be gradual, but we, we don't know. What are your hopes about Second Life 2.0? Again, my, my perspective is very much I will acknowledge the new platform as an ongoing thing, so I don't have expectations ne necessarily for it when it would become live. Um, but then you have the expectation that it should obviously keep that spirit of creating and, and being free to to create, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I hope that it's really got this ability. I mean, there's this been this big thing as a content creator at the moment, which is the obviously the introduction of Mesh. And Mesh is obviously made externally. And Mesh has just become the new holy grail for builders um, in terms of what you can achieve with it. But for a lot of people that haven't been able to transition, um, or the people who, who don't necessarily have the time, or like building outside of Second Life is one of the things I don't like. The strange thing is when I'm building stuff, I use uh, Blender as my tool. Um, when I'm building a Blender, I still have to be logged in in Second Life. I have this weird thing. I still have Second Life on one screen and we'll do the, the, the work in the other one. I really hope that there's a continuation. An opportunity to, to, to create in-world. Yes, that you're not just leaving it to the sort of professional 3D uh, designers to, to create the content. You're losing such a big thing if you... But I have heard um, from um, people in Lind Lab how difficult it is to build a platform where you're making it, you know, an, an editing um, platform where you can make things as well as a, a, a platform where you can move around and explore. They're, they're two very different things that you're trying to kind of jam together. And certainly for sort of server loading and stuff, that's a weird one when you're dealing with traffic moving around and then people creating things. Um, that's, a, that's a tricky one. So, so one of the things would definitely be that there's still a, a good potential to create things in Second Life. I think that that is a crucial thing because that really also sets Second Life apart. It's not just sort of a, a dumping ground for content. You're creating content, then you dump it there, and then you you know you go back and uh, and creating some more. I mean that in real time creation, the real time construction site with other people is 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 the key. Let me ask you about if you have any suggestions that that interest me. Land is too expensive, but how should Linden Lab? make money and sustain itself if they don't charge for land. Do you have the silver bullet? <laughs> I don't have that silver bullet. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that Second Life have so many people on forums telling them what they should and shouldn't do. I've never seen the accountancy sheet for Second Life for, for Linden Lab. And I, I don't know. And I'm not going to pretend that I do know the answer to those questions. We're sociologists, Kaya. We're not economists. Indeed. We don't have MBAs. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's a good thing. Sorry, MBAs. No offense. Uh, 
I'm interested in what you think about the VR explosion. Now, uh, I was just actually uh, putting some news together out of Sundance. The Sundance Festival uh, is still going here in the United States, and, and VR is big there. They have all these demos. They have the birdie demo where you lie on a contraption, and you have the Oculus on, and you feel like you're you're flying like a bird. And they have tons of demos like that they have of course noni de la pena with the project syria where you can visit a uh, a syrian refugee camp they have uh unveiled oculus studio which is a movie production company with vr content everybody is about vr and uh as i'm compiling this news robin harper uh, formerly robin linden emails me because she always goes to sundance and she sends me a link and she says, those demos are great, but there is no life. There is no no people in those. And that's exactly how I feel. I mean, this is a stage where there's an explosion in hardware. Everybody's very psyched about it. But I haven't seen beyond isolated demos a concept that lets, number one, that, that connects it all. Philip Rosedale's original vision, right? The, 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 the connectedness of the metaverse. and But number two, also empowering the user empowering the user to create content like second life did and there is no such thing in that world so how do you feel about this whole resurgence of vr take it where take it where you will i think to a large degree it's a it's a bubble and uh it will it will maybe lead to some technologies which may help pave the path to the future but there's a weird line with me in terms of virtual worlds and virtual reality i like my mind to go somewhere and a lot of these technologies are about trying to immerse you as a person much more in a virtual world whereas what i like to do is create triggers that can put my mind somewhere because it's the sort of argument between is a book more entertaining than a television when you read a book you're, you're reading the words and your imagination is creating those pictures and those images. Whereas when you're watching television, it's being presented. In a virtual world as it stands at the moment without sort of dawning a headset, um, my, my mind can take me into that world probably more, much more successfully than putting on a headset, which would just get in the way and be clunky and, and I'd get motion sickness and all of these things. It's just not there yet. So my argument still is I'm still reading the book. I'm not ready to watch television yet. I still read paper books. I love them. I don't read anything on a Kindle or, or an electronic device. I like that. I love Second Life and I love virtual worlds, but I also like books. And I think you're hinting at something really profound here. My criticism also would be that the, that the goggles, at this stage anyway, are killing a little bit of that imagination, a little bit of that what we have to still kind of create in our minds when we engage in Second Life, right? Uh, they take that away. And so th that's not always a good thing. Absolutely. I mean, it's got to happen because I do think there, there will, will become a point in the future where we're not looking at a screen, where there will be... Um, there was a guy I was watching a lecture from a couple of days ago, and I can't remember his name. Um, Ray something or other, Kurtz, Kurtz. Ray Kurzweil, yeah. That's the one. And he was talking about, you know, in, in maybe 20 years' time, there'll be, you know, bio uh, technology where you'll you'll have little um, little robotic bots that travel around your blood and can go into your head, and they can cut off the nerve impulses that feed data from your senses in reality and swap them for, for a virtual world. So you will have that full integration. Uh, to get to that point, it will have to go through the virtual reality stage. And that's all fine. And it will do that. And I think it's still worthwhile doing all of those things. But, but, but still, the power is always how you make somebody connect. And at the moment, imagination is still a much more powerful way to connect to a virtual world than trying to artificially stimulate senses. Exactly. And I think this is this cannot be uh, overstated because Second Life in that sense is still revolutionary. It, it's a, it, was an, a, a revo it was a real revolutionary thought to create something that engages the imagination like that, but in the digital in the digital arena um, and really empower the user to almost relearn how that muscle works. Right. I mean, because arguably in school, 
uh, all of us get so, get that sort of beaten out of us to some extent. I absolutely agree. Somebody, I remember somebody, uh, a philosopher saying once about um, talking about how if you go into a classroom of, of five-year-olds and you ask them who's creative here, they'll all raise their hand without a, without a question. If you go into a class of eight or 11 year olds and you say the same thing maybe one if anybody would put the hand up there is something that 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 takes away our creativity and everybody has that we delegate it to the pros like i delegate to you to build a house because i can't do it but you can do it. it's not i don't think it's that we delegate it i think that it's within society creative creativity isn't seen as the valuable thing that it is it is seen as a hobby or as, as something else, when when creativity is what's built the world around us. That's a good point. So you're, you're saying basically because it has no real economic value. I mean, initially, if you don't make money, then you go like, yeah, OK, you can do it as a hobby, but it, otherwise it has no value. But look at this guy. Look at Frank Geary. He's a pro. Yeah. In that sense, you were correct in that we delegate the inventions and the creations of our modern society to a few limited people. When what would happen if... if creativity became a much bigger thing through everybody at what what rate would we see a very different world then and i think that's where second life is an incredible thing because it allows people to be creative or explore the idea of being creative i said i have a lot of people who will say to me that they can't build how do they do this i said we well, just need to invest the time it's just time i don't believe that people aren't creative i think everybody is creative what people lack is the fact that they just don't put in the time it always takes time. I, I've been building a second line for 10 years. That's taken time. That's not about being skilled at building, really. It's time. I just put in the time. But you also need to overcome labeling and self-labeling. Uh, I have an 11-year-old. I always use him as the guinea pig here on the show because he's a really gifted uh, musician. But I realize now that depending on your personality, when you see someone who is a lot better, Right now, my son is obsessing with sort of a child prodigy who lives here in town. He's, I don't know, five years old. He plays violin, and it's it's remarkable. And he was on TV, right? So my son says, why is he on TV? He sounds awful. And I go, Khalil, he is kind of a dancing elephant. And when an elephant dances, the TV crew will show up, and they will put it on the local news. Um, it's remarkable that for this age, he plays like that. But that's not to say that you should stop pursuing this just because he is at a stage where you weren't when you were that age. Yes. But you're right in that we're obsessed with labeling and grading uh, talent or skills, whatever it might be. One of the things that, I, that always resonates with me, and it was a guy called Ter Terence McKenna, who, who I remember him saying this, and he said, um, culture is not your friend. And I see culture personally as the software code for first life reality. Culture is, is code that governs our behavior, our expectations, the way we label creativity or grade something. Somebody that might uh, play a violin, a classical instrument would be seen higher as somebody that might play an instrument that may not be normally seen in an orchestra. But that doesn't mean there's any difference in the, in the skill level that they would need to acquire that. But it's culture that gives us those, those measures of, of what's good or what's bad. And, and I love the idea that like, if you understand the culture isn't your friend, let it go write your own software, write your own program and create your own culture. You define what's good. You define what is creative. Stop letting culture do that for you. Takes uh, stubbornness to some extent and, uh, and persistence, or which some people say it's the same. Kai, this is an absolutely fascinating conversation. We have to wrap it up. My final question is, how do you, do you hide your second life or are you, uh, like me, uh, a crazy evangelist where people, when they see me approaching, run and, uh, and go to the other side of the street? <laughs> or do you just, uh, you know, you play it cool? Uh, somewhere in between. I wouldn't go around telling people necessarily. Uh, what's happened certainly in my work environment is people, because I work in the events industry now, and uh, bit by bit, people have heard and they become fascinated uh, by it. And I've had so many conversations where it will normally be over lunch and the, the, there's a canteen at work and people were like, what do you do? I don't understand it. 
I don't get it. And I will sit there for an hour and I'll explain it in every way I possibly can. And they are deeply fascinated. You can see this like, like desire to really understand it and really get it. But the more that you tell them to try and explain it, the more confounded and confused they seem to get by it. Um, so I'm, I'm by no means shy about it. I will happily explain it. And I go into a lot of depth. And I, I always try and pitch the, the, the psychological, the social implication and what this means for people as an in individual rather than just describing it as this crazy world. Well, Kaya, thank you for this uh, uh, focus group that is uh, sponsored by Linden Lab. Let's get our checks and let's go for some drinks at the Angel Banner. <laughs> <laughs> Linden's Indeed. okay. Now analyze the data. Uh, we're out of here. <laughs> So that was Kaya Angel. We linked to his work and his uh, video, as we had previously said. This is also maybe an incentive for the community to produce lots and lots of these types of videos. I would suggest to make them short because uh, unless you're a Second Life enthusiast, you will not watch anything that's longer than um, yeah, maybe a minute. But uh, if you guys go out there and produce videos under the SL Looks Good Today or whatever uh, banner, shorter do a couple seconds bad SL and then do the rest of the minute gorgeous SL and then a title card at the end, you know, made with love and imagination or whatever you, you come up with and put that stuff out on YouTube and flood it, flood the YouTubes or the Vimeos, whatever. We have arrived at the end of the show. It's really sad to do this without Joe. <clears throat> I know you guys miss her if it's just for the fact that you have to hear uh, me all the time monologuing. What am I going to do this weekend? Well, I'm going to be uh, interviewing Nylon Pinkney for the upcoming show, but I'm also going to enjoy hopefully positive feedback about episode 26, which is out today, an episode about Absinthe, a virtual model. So go out and watch it. I'm not going to say any more about this episode. I think it's a powerful episode and I want to thank everyone who submitted their real life Second Life photo that we used for this uh, video. And uh, people submitted also video footage. Not everybody is in there. Some people may have ended up on the cutting room floor, but it's it's brutal to, to, to do th that sequence in such a short amount of time. And I think about 50 people submitted uh, footage and it's just amazing. And I'm really thankful. It's an amazing community. It's a diverse community. And I really hope that I uh, was able to, to capture that. Matt P. buried uh, a game that is grid wide with, with global positioning system, sl global, global positioning system, SL global positioning system. I don't know what that is, but you got to go play buried because I made the trailer. Game starts February 1st. It's mole day 2015. Uh, that's February 2nd. What is a mole? I don't know what a mole is, but I'm going to read the press release for you. Uh, it started in 2010. By the residents of Bay City, Mole Day is set aside to show appreciation for the moles and their many contributions to Bay City. And the moles are people of the Linden Department of Public Works. They work as moles. They fix the streets. They pave the roads. So this is a this is a way to appreciate these moles. It's with music. It's with DJ Go Speed Racer and Marky Helstein is performing. That's February second at the Bay City Fairgrounds. Well, that's it for the show today. Thank you for listening. Have a fabulous weekend. And Joe, buy yourself a mobile phone so I can reach you. I can reach you 24-7. It's only fair, Joe. Don't you think? Come on. All right. Bye. The Drag Styles Radio Hour with Joe Yardley is a weekly production of Basic Drags Entertainment. The show is supported by Maven Homes, Giza Creations, Leap Motion, SL Go By On Live, Stitcher, Ison, Bot Girls Identity Circus, Caravel Design, Vicar Creations, Humanoid Animations, Loki Elliot, Botanical, Death Row Designs, Mad P Games, Angel Red Couture, Fallen Gods Incorporated, Blue Moon Enterprises, What's Next, Avacon, and Landscapes Unlimited. Contact the show via Skype, Drax Files, Avatar Drax Files, or email radio at draxfiles.com. Sorry, I'm a bit late. I just had to get some extra cigarettes. And oh, wait, what? We done? Are you are you done sh recording? Joe, I'm. I've been done. Uh, I'm done uh, editing. I. <laughs> well, well.
Uh, auf Wiedersehen. Virtual Reality is only then really awesome when you can go into a virtual world, order some cigarettes and have them delivered in real life to your door. Oh, that would be great. Can I have some Gulabasis sans filter, please? Yes. Uh, Linden Lab, I know you're listening and please focus on this feature right now. Forget about all the distribution of content. Direct virtual reality to real reality cigarette delivery. Oh, and I want a bottle of wine as well and uh, a sailor. <laughs>